for joining online in some face-to-face. Uh, -face. And uh, I would like to introduce you our presenter today. Uh, is Dr. Samir. Uh, he's a visiting fellow. He's with us uh, for one month. And uh, Dr. Samir is an associate professor and senior biostatistician at McMaster University in Canada. Uh, his research interests are in the design, conduct, and analysis of randomized clinical trials. And he has served as a lead biostatistician for large multiple center trials in many clinical areas. And he teaches Mendel's uh, students in clinical trial methodology and uh, applied biostatistics um, at McMaster University. So thank you, um, Dr. Simeon, for your time. And the floor is yours. Thank you, Molly, and uh, thank you for uh, having me here at Stonebush in Cape Town. It's a it's a pleasure pleasure to be here. It's a it's a pleasure. Okay, it's a it's a pleasure to be here today. We're going to be uh, talking about diagnosis and uh, methods to synthesize this diagnostic data and uh, meta-analysis techniques, specifically the statistical analysis methods for pooling uh, diagnostic accuracy data. So the brief summary of systematic reviews for diagnostic accuracy study, this is pretty standard to um, systematic reviews of clinical trials, but there are some nuances that maybe you should be aware of. And so we'll go through this briefly. And I think it's important, even though many of you will be familiar with this. And then we'll go through the statistical methods for pooling the uh, diagnostic indices. So in our field of clinical research, everything, any disease, we are diagnosed um, when we go to see the clinician. And here, these are some cartoons. On the left hand side, you'll see that's pretty much a false positive, false negative results. The labs are showing that everything is normal, but the patient has some sort of disease. And then with Google and uh, AI now, everyone comes to the doctor for a second opinion because they have self diagnosed themselves on their internet. So for any disease, we go through diagnostic tests, you know, biopsies for um cancer any imaging that you take um whether it be cardiac you know orthopedic imaging that's diagnosing a fracture or any malefacts in your heart biomarkers are used for diagnosis of disease um, bacterial cultures used for infections and there's just general signs and symptoms that when you go into a doctor they look at you and you have a fever and they say okay there is some pretest probability of some disease and so forth. So signs and symptoms also can be considered disease uh, diagnostic tests. Now each of these imaging or diagnostic tests come with some level of accuracy for diagnosing disease. This level of accuracy is generally measured against a gold or reference standard. In many cases, we don't have a gold standard. We don't really know what um, through disease or not, and so we use a reference standard. And generally, one of the most common designs to estimate these accuracy for diagnostic indices is a diagnostic cohort study. So here is an example of a diagnostic cohort study that I was involved in where we were looking at D-dimer to exclude pulmonary embolism, which is a blood clot in your heart, for patients uh, who presented to the emergency clinic in Canada. And here we were saying a blood test could be just as good as a CT scan of the lung because everybody who came in and suspected had to get a CT scan and CT scans are expensive. And so it's an inefficient method to diagnose blood clots. But if you have a very high D-dimer level, then maybe you should go get a CT scan so you can rule out uh, patients who are, don't need a CT scan. Now, this study was conducted in Canadian centers, primarily academic centers. And one thing is we want to know, well, 
this is in Canadian patients in Canadian academic centers. Will this work somewhere else? So why do a diagnostic meta-analysis? One is you want to see whether it, the diagnostic accuracy indices that were shown in many studies are applicable to your setting. You may want to assess the heterogeneity in different subpopulations of the diagnostic test. This is a new test that was a new diagnostic algorithm. Um, you know, it was published in 2019. And then you may want to synthesize the evidence around this. And in some cases, there may be a lot of small studies and you want to pool the data together to get some larger, uh, more precise estimate of the diagnostic indices. So those are the reasons to do a diagnostic meta-analysis. Next question is, when should you do one? In a local setting, you may want to do one when you're going to implement the diagnostic test in your environment. There's a new test. You want to synthesize the evidence, make sure that look at the heterogeneity in the evidence and see whether it will be uh, work in your environment. In other cases, there is a new test and you want to replace it or you want to remove an old test and therefore you want to synthesize the evidence again to see whether you have a better test than what's already being implemented or you can remove the old test. <laughs> But the first part before doing any of this is formulating your question. And as you know, this is probably the toughest part of any research project. The first is you have to explicitly lay out the population that you're going to study. And this may seem obvious, but it can be quite challenging as in diagnostic tests, you want to know, you know, who are the suspected people? Are you taking all comers? Are you taking high risk, low risk, moderate risk? The second is the diagnostic test. That's number two. And that's pretty clear. You may have a diagnostic test that you want to study. And the third is the gold or reference standard. Now in systematic reviews, the challenge comes here if different reference standards are used in different studies. That makes systematic reviews very challenging because your heterogeneity between the studies is definitely increased when you have different reference standards. And then the fourth is the disease you're trying to capture. So once somebody has all these in place, the next thing is you go to Prospero or Cochrane and you know you have a search of the databases to see if anyone else is doing the same um, uh, systematic review. We did a systematic review. We proposed a systematic review of estrogen um, associated venous thromboembolism, a diagnostic one. And when we searched Prospero, we saw that a Dutch group was doing the same thing. And then so we just collaborated and made things more efficient. So always a good idea to do this. And then there is a sort of prisma related to diagnostic uh, test accuracy. It's a 27 item diagnostic accuracy check for reporting, but can also be used when designing so you know what to put in your proposal and protocol. And then you go through your search and you know this is no different than a systematic review for randomized trials, Medline, Embase, biographies and the gray literature. But there are some additional diagnostic study registries um, like the Cochrane da database for systematic reviews. And then there is a health technology assessment database at York, which also contains diagnostic um, accuracy systematic reviews. So always good to have a look at those to see if anything has been done or um, is in the progress of being being done. So for systematic reviews of diagnostic accuracy studies, there's going to be a group of manuscripts that involve the condition, so the disease. There's going to be a group of manuscripts that includes the test condition, so the new test that you are assessing. And then there's going to be a group of manuscripts that involve the population. And what you're looking for is the intersection of all those three. So here's an example, and this is a CT for bleeding in older patients who have fallen. 
fallen. So in our neck of the woods, every patient who is above 65 and has fallen down and hit their head usually gets a CT for bleeding in the brain. So here are the three components. One is whether you fall or accidental fall, minor belt injury. So that's um, the second is the group, the population. You want it to be the elderly or seniors or patients older to 65. And then the third is the test. And here it is the CT scan and anything related to uh, computer tomography and brain injuries. So the intersection will be one, two, and three. Second examples, previous similar to my diagnostic um, study is uh, CT for uh, pulmonary embolism. So here it's CT, pulmonary embolism, and you limit it to um, humans. So you can see here that when you just look at pulmonary embolism, there's, you know, 134,000 hits. Um, just look at CT scan, there is, you know, 630,000 hits. When you combine them, there's about 13,000 hits. And then when you limit it to humans, you get about 12,000 hits, which is a much more manageable number of uh, papers that you have to go through, abstracts. And then, when you limit it to diagnosis, where it's like you're looking at diagnostic accuracy, which is in this case, uh, the filter is best balance of sensitivity and specificity, which I'll go through in a bit, you get down to about 2000. So that's just an example of how one would do it. So in diagnostic accuracy, there's a lot of search filters. There's a lot of challenges in identifying these studies in systematic reviews because they're not well reported and there's no consistent jargon to describe these. So suitable indexing is not really um, available and therefore many people have tried to develop these filters to increase the precision of these searches. And these are just uh, text words and database indexing that uh, can uh, increase the precision. So there are many, many filters for diagnostic accuracy studies. Um, and some of these were studied by Lee Flang and colleagues uh, way back in 2006 to see, to look at the performance in them. And you can see that they vary in performance, uh, some with more missed um, uh, manuscripts and some with less. And this is also a, a sort of diagnostic accuracy study, if you if you will, because there is you know sensitivity and specificity. And in this case, what they're looking for is pretty high sensitivity and and high precision. And precision here is just positive predictive value, which is A over A plus B. And then um, Richie et al. looked at a lot of these filters and tried to get a uh, estimate of sensitivity and specificity and precision around all the um, all the filters that have been developed for for filtering out diagnostic accuracy studies, and you can see here the sensitivity again and the and the precision vary greatly between these. And this is just a um, a follow up to that, um, which was published in 2011, again showing you that the sensitivity and precision around these uh, vary quite greatly. But these are all available on that York um, website in, uh, in the UK. So just as in other systematic reviews of clinical trials, I think it's important that you be explicit and set out your goals and your data extraction a priori. One should have a trial run. You know, you cannot predict the problems that will arise in these in these diagnostic um, systematic reviews. And so, you know, piloting of the of the extraction form and the data that you are going to receive um, should be done. And the other thing is you should have some content expertise in terms of the medical condition and the test that you are you are looking at. And as always, check, recheck, and then check again. If you have um, missed data and data that is not a 
available in the paper, contact and recontact the authors. You may want to, um, you know, offer them authorship if that gets them to provide you the data. And again, this is just aggregate data, so it can be sent in 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 an email if 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 be. And just as in any systematic review, again, you have to assess the quality of the studies in there. And the Quadis tool is um, the risk of bias assessment that um, can be can be used, and it provides a risk of bias for for each study and should be done in each systematic review. So very similar structure of conducting systematic reviews, just some nuances in the diagnostic accuracy framework. So after data extraction, this is a simplistic data structure what you should have. You should have the column of studies, the number of true positives, false negatives, false positives, and true negatives for each study. Once you have this sort of data structure and it's hopefully complete and independent, we can discuss how do we pool the data. So majority of diagnostic papers will report sensitivity and specificity. The meta-analytic approaches have focused on these measures. But pooling pairs of sensitivity and specificity is not straightforward as you may think, and I'll show you why. So just to go over, sensitivity is the proportion of patients with disease whose test has a result above a particular threshold. And specificity is the proportion of patients with no disease whose test is below a threshold. Now thresholds can vary between studies. The easiest threshold to think of is if a cut point of a biomarker or a test is used differently between two studies. And that one can say, oh, the threshold varies. So in, uh, in venous thromboembolism, some people use 500 milli units, other people use 1,000 units, and that's a different threshold for positivity. But it's more likely that there is threshold differences in, in um, areas where there is a judgment or subjectivity based on the diagnosis. When you're looking at a scan or imaging, or you're looking at a biopsy, where there is some judgment and subjectivity, the threshold for positivity may vary within the study if there's different people looking at it, and it may very well vary between studies. And so the same threshold, so different thresholds will lead to different es estimates of uh, sensitivity specificity, and also the same threshold may, may yield different accuracy in different groups. So here is um, two normally distributed curves, and we're looking at the left side is the non-diseased and the right side is the diseased, and here's an arbitrary threshold um, that I put in where the sensitivity is 71% and the specificity is 99%. Now, if I were to lower the threshold, thereby making more patients positive, my sensitivity will increase, but my specificity will decrease. And here I'm going to have more false positives because I've lowered my threshold and therefore I'm making more patients positive whether they have disease or not. If I take this to the extreme where I lower it even more, I increase sensitivity to 99% because everyone's going to be tested positive and I decrease specificity to 71. So increasing the threshold increases specificity but decreases sensitivity. Decreasing the threshold increases sensitivity, but decreases specificity. So this is okay if you have a continuous biomarker and you can cut point them, but when it's subjective and somebody's looking at an image, it is harder to do because you don't really know where that cut point it lies. And that's where this threshold comes is more challenging. So the intuitive way to do this, and if somebody were not, you know, saying we're not thinking about this carefully, would be like we would take all the sensitivities, 
and all the specificities, and we would pool them separately. They're all proportions, so it would be a standard meta-analysis of single proportions. You take all the sensitivities, pull them with a random effects meta-analysis. You take all the specificities and pull them um, with a random effects meta-analysis of a uh, single proportion. And I think that's OK to get a sense of the data, what the estimates would be. But these threshold effects bring a correlation between sensitivity and specificity, as I showed you. As the threshold moves, one increases and the other decreases, and they cannot both increase as the threshold moves. So that is correlation negatively correlated. So the separate pooling of measures to report is not recommended. It may be OK for getting a sense of the data. And realizing this, a method was proposed, and this is called the summary receiving operating curve. And what this does is it converts the pairs of sensitivity and specificity into a single diagnostic accuracy measure. And this is the diagnostic odds ratio. And simply, it is the raw odds of positivity in the diseased and relative to the odds of positivity in the non-diseased. And it's the positive likelihood ratio versus this. So once you have this, you can create the summary rock. But the first step is to plot the observed pairs of sensitivity and specificity in each study in an ROC space. So this is the ROC space that we probably are all familiar with, with sensitivity on the y-axis and one minus specificity on the x-axis. And this is an example from of a study looking at uh, comparisons of uh, lymphangiography, CT, and MRI for the diagnosis of lymph node metastases in women with cervical cancer, which was published in uh, JAMA couple of decades back. And so here you'll see that every dot, uh, every circle square represents the sensitivity and specificity from uh, the studies uh, looking at MRI, um, CT, and lingerography. So the aim of this summary ROC approach is to find a smooth curve around these points for each of the modalities. So the first thing you want would do, and this is, you know, would be to transform the sensitivity and the one minus specificity on a scale that becomes more linear. And then you can fit a regression line through it. So once you transform it, you can fit a regression line through it and then transform it back. That's generally what the SR rock does. So the accuracy is given by the diagnostic odds ratio, and then the term S is a proxy for the threshold um, positivity. And it's not really the positivity, but it's a threshold for it, and it's used as a proxy. And once you have this, you can sort of do this, this linear regression. But the value of S, um, if it's zero, then the sensitivity and specificity are equal. If S is uh, positive, uh, sensitivity is higher. And if S is negative, specificity is higher. So once you do that, you do a linear regression where you have the diagnostic odds ratio, alpha, and beta S. Now, this seems pretty straightforward, but the interpretation is a bit challenging. So when um, S is zero, then the intercept here is obviously the summarized uh, diagnostic odds ratio. However, when S is not zero, um, the diagnostic odds ratio is dependent on the threshold and there's no direct um, interpretation. So once you put in that into the, the uh, regression model, you'll get estimates of alpha and beta. And you can use this to um, um, estimate the uh, sensitivity and specificity. So once you get alpha and beta, you transform it back into the standard a uh, ROC plane, and you can see this formula where you can, for different ranges of specificity, you plug in the specificity and you'll get a sensitivity. So you can do this for a whole range of specificities, and so then you'll get a uh, the 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 sensitivities. So here you could see that 
you don't get summary estimates of sensitivity and specificity. You don't get a pooled estimate of summary and specificity for a whole range of specificities. You can get a, a whole range of uh, sensitivities. One has to specify a value of specificity to obtain a value of sensitivity. Hence, you're not really pooling all the data. Some report the sensitivity and specificity at the Q point. And the Q point is basically where this line going from uh, one to one intersects with the ROC curve. So the ROC curve is got from a range of values. But sometimes when you do this, the range, of, the estimates of sensitivity and specificity are out of range. And when I say out of range, they're not in the range that was in your actual studies that you used to do the meta analysis. So you get a sensitivity and specificity, but none of the studies in the in the in the um, systematic review have something in the range. So the, it's completely out of range and therefore not really useful. But it still provides you with a summary curve where one can look at the range of sensitivity and specificities over, over um, all the studies. The major problem with this is that this is like a fixed effects type of model. And there is no between study heterogeneity included in here. It's a standard regression model. And therefore the between study heterogeneity that we use in standard random effects models is not included. It only assumes variation in the threshold effect, that the thresholds are different, but no between study um, heterogeneity. So to do this, there have been some more robust approaches that have been recommended. And the two that I'm going to go through are the hierarchical summary receiving operating curve and the bivariate model. So first the hierarchical summary approach, and I, it says SROC in here, but this is technically very different than the SROC presented before. So in the first level, the within subject, uh, study variability is considered by assuming a binomial distribution between sensitivity and specificity. Now in the second level, the between study heterogeneity is accounted for by a random effects model on the accuracy, which is the diagnostic odds ratio and the threshold. So each are assumed to have a normal distribution, uh, which is standard to conventional meta-analysis. So they're both um, have their own uh, normal distribution and they're independent. And, and to account for the correlation between the sensitivity and specificity, the diagnostic odds ratio is modeled using a logic model rather than just calculating it at the start and then pooling it together. So you're actually modeling that. So this takes the previous method and includes the between, sub, uh, the between study heterogeneity by modeling uh, random effects around the ac accuracy and threshold, and it accounts for the correlation using the logic model for sensitivity and specificity. So now here, all levels of correlation are accounted for and between study methods are accounted for as well. Again, for this method in a similar way, you can specify specificity and a whole a range of specificities to account for specificity. It also leads to a summary rock for a range of values. However, just as I mentioned, it is not the same as a summary rock that you saw previously because this is technically using uh, more uh, modeling and uh, hierarchical, hierarchical heterogeneity use. And more importantly, it handles between st study variability. From the model, you can also do post hoc transformations to get actual summary pooled estimates of specificity and sensitivity. And the model can also be extended to add covariates where you can test for heterogeneity um, for sensitivity and specificity separately. So this model by Cochrane has been recommended and it's um, I think implemented in, in uh, standard statistical software like, like the RevMan. So this is the same example where um, this is the hierarchical 
um, SROC approach. And then the points here are the pool estimate done by post hoc uh, transformations. So this is a step up from the SROC approach and recommended for use. This next is the bivariate model. And uh, this is a method that provides, it um, keeps the two dimensional nature of the data, the sensitivity and specificity, and it allows for the correlation between them and the between study correlation. So again, the within study is considered assuming a binomial distribution for sensitivity and one minus specificity. Now, the between study, it assumes the sensitivities from the study and the one minus specificity from the study are normally distributed around a certain mean and variability. Okay? And this is similar for any any uh, any um, random effects model. And so if you have two normal distributed um, items and they're correlated, you make them uh, bivariate normal distribution. So you have a normal, you know, after it's transformed, the sensitivities are normally distributed. After it's transformed, the, um, the specificities are normally distributed and then they're too correlated and therefore you can come to a bivariate normal distribution. So once you have that data, um, this can be analyzed by a single linear mixed model where you um, put in a um, the correlation and then the hierarchical structure for the random effects for sensitivities and specificity separately. And as I said, the bivariate nature of the model uh, accounts for the correlation between them. And this can be done by a simple linear mixed model in any major statistical software. And then at the end of this, you can provide a pooled estimate of sensitivity and specificity accounting for the between study heterogeneity and the correlation. You can also calculate other measures such as the diagnostic odds ratio and likelihood ratios. And similar to the hierarchical summary approach, covariates can be added to test their effects on sensitivity and specificity again separately. So again, this is a recommended model. But the challenging point here is if you just get a pooled sensitivity and specificity using studies that use different thresholds, then the pool sensitivity and specificity is for some unspecified average of the threshold. We don't really know what the threshold, average threshold is. And so the pool sensitivity and specificity have limit in their usefulness because they're over averaged over a whole range of thresholds. So one should be careful when using this if they suspect there's varying degrees of thresholds used within the studies in the diagnostic accuracy. But for in a case where you know the thresholds are very similar, you can do this and get a pooled estimate of sensitivity and specificity. Again, these are noted by the um, dots in, in, this, in this ROC. And then there is a prediction interval around it, um, which indicates the statistical heterogeneity um, within uh, within each of these modalities. The other thing one can do here now is because you have um, pooled estimates of sensitivity and specificity for each of the modalities, and you can see them here, you can calculate differences between them. Now it's important to know here, this is sort of comparing um, sensitivities and specificities in different studies. So even though it's presented here, you know, the studies of CT may be different from the studies from MRI, and therefore you're not just comparing, you have to take into account that this is um, this is challenging here and the interpretation is not so straightforward. But uh, just showing you that it can be done. So in summary, I think one um, should be careful when formulating a, a question. Uh, these questions should be very explicit and detailed. Uh, search whether there is already being an SR that has been conducted. Highly recommend working a, with a librarian on doing the search 
Um, extracting the data should be explicit and be done by two individuals in duplicate. Understanding the sources of heterogeneity from the study designs that are included. As I mentioned, pooling indices separately is only OK if you want to get a, sen uh, a sense of the data. I would recommend not presenting this in a in a report. The SROC approach has its limitations because it does not take into account between study heterogeneity and the correlation between sensitivity and uh, specificity. I think if there's large variability in diagnostic indices and thresholds, one may be better off using the uh, hierarchical SROC approach to provide a, a graph of the sensitivities and specificities as, um, you know, the heterogeneity and the threshold effects limit the, the um, interpretation of a pooled estimate of sensitivity and specificity. However, if there's limited variability and similar thresholds, which is sometimes very hard to justify, then one can use a bivariate model um, to estimate um, the pool sensitivity and specificity. And the last thing is always choose the appropriate method to answer the research question. I'd like to thank you and uh, the Carnegie African Diaspora Fellowship for uh, funding my visit to South Africa. Thank you. Thank you so much, Simon, for the great presentation. It was quite a learning curve for me. <laughs> uh, I did a consultation on systematic reverse diagnostic test accuracy. For now, I'll put it on hold. <laughs> I still have to learn a lot. So uh, we still have time for questions. Um, those online, you can either type your questions in the chat or you can also raise your hand um, and ask the question. And also those who are here can also type the questions. OK, so I have one question. So maybe whilst you're uh, waiting for questions from other people, um, you mentioned about uh, use of different gold standards. Uh, so in that case, how do you handle that if the different gold standards have been used? And is it a big common problem when you do meta-analysis for diagnosis test accuracy? That's a good question. Um, so um, um, it is a common problem. You know, in many, many areas, um, there's different different goal standards. Um, the approach I've used now is to is to um, is to analyze them separately. I pull them separately. There is um, um, another level of models, but not easily implemented, where you can um, look at the correlation again within the different uh, reference standards. Um, but you need a lot of studies in there for the model to converge and it's not easily to model. So I think, um, you know, just like any other meta-analysis, um, once once the heterogeneity increases to a certain level, you're not comfortable pooling, pooling those. So um, the, the approach I use now is just to consider them separate. Yeah. Questions? Thank you very much for this good presentation. My name is Vesta. I'm a postdoc fellow. An extension to what Maureen asked, I want to know in case where diagnostic tests have been approved at different institutions. For example, if the diagnostic test was approved by FDA, we have a diagnostic test that was approved by adults. How does it work in those circumstances? Yeah, so it, it's a good problem. Most of these tests will be approved by the FDA before we can use them anyways. Um, but for our institution, what we do when we do it is we usually have a current test. That is it. And basically it is a decision whether the new test greatly improves the diagnostic accuracy with some cost benefit. <laughs> And so while we're trying to implement a new test in our, we'll do a systematic review, 
will assess the heterogeneity and applicability to our our local hospital. And then if we do show that the sensitivity and specificity is better compared to what we currently have, then it becomes a, a cost issue. It's more feasibility, whether it's affordable and <laughs> in that situation. Yeah. Thanks, Dennis, and uh, we'll have to take it now. So it's like um, Mike said, a very nice training um, opportunity uh, in this field. Um, just thinking through the predictive value of the positive case, sometimes depending on the free rights yeah. of the disease in the particular area. How would we factor that when we can't do this? Right. So um, that's why these things mainly focus on sensitivity and specificity, because they are generally less affected by prevalence. I would not recommend using these approaches to pool um, positive predictive value and negative predictive value because they vary you know, they were largely affected by prevalence. Um, one approach, if you want, is after you do a meta-analysis of this sort, you can do post hoc um, estimates of, of uh, predictive values based on prevalence range. But I would, I would, I would uh, argue against pooling positive predictive values and negative predictive values because they're very, very much affected by prevalence. Yeah. Any questions online? Um, just um, how, how you can go on it? Yes. Thank you, Samir. It's Carl Lombard speaking. So you, you talked about the different gold standards uh, and what that you analyze them separately. So has there been work done where the gold standard is not really a true gold standard, but as some measurement error itself. Um, you know, has, has there been any work done in, in, in that direction to add another error component to, to these models? Yeah, that's a good point. So I've seen the work done within a study where the reference standard um, has measurement error and you use techniques to um, you know, adjust that so that you get a more truthful estimate of sensitivity and specificity. I haven't seen it done in the meta-analysis form, but I know that it can be done within each study. So <laughs> it makes it a bit more tricky for meta-analysis because you have to go to the authors and tell them to, you know, do this um, adjustment because there's measurement error. Um, or, or you could do it yourself if you had the data, but I have not seen it fully taken into account for on an overall approach for meta analysis. Thanks. Does that does that answer your question? Yeah, no, that's that's thanks. Well, my paper that. That reminded me of uh, the data we coming from the public data um, and the rapid development of this point of care test. Um, it was seen that um, when the is a big test scan and you have want to identify COVID um, and you don't test within the first seven days and uh, the likelihood your test will be negative post negative was relatively high I just kind of thinking if the studies were done in that setting and you come to do this kind of analysis how would you factor that in it, it's again, it's challenging. It's it's hard to factor into the into the meta analysis because, as again, this the that's a within study issue, which which um is hard to model if you don't ha if you just have the aggregate data, it's hard to model. Again, it's the same sort of issue here where there's that error um, of when you do the testing, and it's hard to do it on a aggregate level. Yeah. Um Thanks, Um That's a quick one. Uh, that's on the structure of the uh, model that you had or used in 
uh, one of the uh, approaches that I like. Uh, I'm just wondering, um, of course, you could each study um, and each study measures the sensitivity specificity. Um, so is it like a, a two level? It's a, it's a two level, uh, oh. yeah. And then you also have the true the true uh, test in there. That's why you can model them together. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I have another question. Um, there was um a lot of assumption where you made um the distribution be normally distributed, and some of the methods. Um, does it matter on the number of studies that you have included on in your I mean, it's it's like anything. I mean, I'm sure it, the lower your number of patients that that goes, but I think it's pretty robust to to that. I also, you know, in some cases, people pool three studies, and I kind of question the reason for pooling three studies uh, diagnostic accuracy. You know, like. Um, you can probably do it in the back of an envelope if you really need it to. And, you know, one of the big goals of diagnostic accuracy is to assess heterogeneity. If you have a small number of studies, it's it's hard to assess heterogeneity because you just don't have the data. But in terms of the normally distributed, it's it's pretty robust even when you have about five studies. Uh, I think when you go below five studies, then you have to question the reason for doing this meta-analysis. Another question, eight to nine from the day, where you indicated the, uh, one of the reasons is true for removing uh, the, the one test, uh, you know, the, as, as one of the reasons for doing, uh, uh, you know, this yeah. approach. So I was just wondering, I mean, uh, in what sense, I mean, do you then, come to say, OK, this is the stuff that I'm removing, uh, given that they all, maybe they, they've used the same accord standard. And, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so the, there's three major ways of doing it, uh, looking at diagnostic tests. One is it's a replacement test, like there's a new test out there and you want to replace the old one. There's an add-on test where you want to add the test in addition to what's there. Maybe it improves your diagnostic accuracy. And then there's the triage one, where it's kind of like the D-dimer one, where I showed you we're going to give them a blood test. If it's really, really, really high, then you go uh, for a full, full-blown uh, imaging test. And um, if you're going to replace, I think you need to make sure that it's measured against the same reference standard, because then you're comparing apples to oranges, and you're not making a a, a true comparison. And this makes it challenging because reference standards changes over time. Just imaging gets better, things get better, and uh, you know it's not easy. But I guess to the best of judgment, you try to make that comparison of like to like, just like anything else. Yeah. So the, the removal has got to be the sense of uh, saying maybe it's not performing uh, compared to the new one. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So you would take you know the old one. The comparison to the reference standard, the new one compares them to the reference standard, and then you would look at the diagnostic accuracy and make that decision. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. For the nice presentation. So my uh, my question is on uh, as you said, you said somebody can just take three studies, then do the try to do the accuracy uh, uh, diagnostic, right? So my question is, are you not, you know, powering your, your the sample size or the number of studies that you have to consider when doing this diagnostic? There's no official power calculation, but I just think in general for, you know, meta-analysis, you know, getting pooled estimates is part of it. I, I agree, but I think, you know, mainly you want to look at the heterogeneity in the in the in the in the indices, and if you have three studies, um, do you really need to pool them? That's the question. Like, you know, yes, you can pool them. That's fine. You can do it. But can you really assess heterogeneity? Uh, 
within three studies. And then the argument is you just present the three studies and this is what we found, and, you know. Um, you know, there's a lot of, it's an easy way to get a publication, no question. <laughs> but the value of it is is a bit uh, not so great. We can't hear you. Um, good afternoon. Thank you very much for the informative presentation. Um, my name is Siafet, a recent graduate in the um, ClinPath um, Master's Program offered at Stellenbosch. Um, I don't know if I phrased this properly, but um, do you perhaps know what strategies or considerations would you recommend for selecting an appropriate, appropriate reference standard um, in a systematic review and meta-analysis for diagnostic accuracy tests, um, particularly when facing um, the potential of geographic variability in the available reference tests. Sorry, Javid, I, I didn't get that. Do you mind repeating it? <laughs> okay, so my question is- it, It's um, not you, it's just the sound here. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, I know it's not you, it's just the, the, the speaker here. Do you mind just repeating it? Okay, let me repeat that. Um, what sort of strategies or considerations would you recommend, um, especially when you when you select an appropriate, or when it comes to selecting an appropriate reference standard um, for a systematic review or meta-analysis for a DAT um, study, um, especially when you are facing the potential of geographic variability in available reference tests? That's a good question. I, I don't think you have control over that really. So your systematic review, I think should incorporate all, all the studies, whether, um, and you will get different reference standards within that systematic review. The question is whether you can pull that data together. And that comes to a question of whether the heterogeneity between the reference standards is very high. So if I were to do a systematic review, I would do it for all. I would gather the data regardless of the reference standard, but um, I may not be uh, pulling them or I may be pulling them separately. So I don't think you should re restrict your systematic review to a particular reference standard. Um, I think that's limiting the information that you can um, that you have in, in, in your search. I think you should present all the data is just whether you pull it or not to pull it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, Thank you. Amen for the great presentation. We are looking forward to your next presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.